Amen. How's it going, second service? All right. All right. That's, again, second service? Let's go. This is a great day. This is a great day. Um, now, there's a couple things that I want to walk you through um, as we're getting in this morning's message because, hey, we just had that big celebration. And um, I want you to know, I felt like God came and spoke to me very specifically about all of this a week ago. When we found out this number, we were getting super, super pumped about everything that we were about to set out to do. I was driving. Sometimes when I'm in the car and I'm, I'm alone, I feel like I hear God better. Maybe it's just because I listen better. Amen. And I'm listening to God and I'm actually on Rogers Lane driving in toward church. And uh, I felt like God just hit me with this very simple question. Not audible. He just impressed it on me. And, and I felt like what he said was, um, Joshua, when you think about the ancient Israelites, the Jewish people, my chosen people, how many of their ancient buildings and relics still exist today? Said, none, Father. Said, okay. Then what is this all about? Is this about the buildings that we build? Is this all about the physical things that we create? I'll show you a picture here. We've got it on, well, maybe we won't have it on the screen. Some of you guys know about the Wailing Wall. Um, the Wailing Wall is, is something that in Jerusalem, it's, it's an old relic. It's a ruin. And it's a ruin. It's, it's, it's one particular wall that's left over from the ancient temple. And if you've studied this before, you know that God's people, as they traveled through the desert, they worshiped God in a holy place called the tabernacle. We don't have that tabernacle today. The Ten Commandments that were etched in stone, that Moses got on Sinai, you know, the Ten Commandments? We don't have those today. The Ark of the Covenant, the gold box, that God's presence was there. We don't have that box today. And then when they got into the promised land, they built a physical temple with stone. Did you know that? And it was a beautiful place. It was a holy place. It was an amazing place. But that temple was destroyed. And then it was rebuilt again by another generation. And then that one was destroyed as well. And then it was rebuilt again. And that one was destroyed as well. The final temple was destroyed by Emperor Titus, the Roman emperor in AD 70. And when he went in and he destroyed everything and he carted away the relics that were inside of the temple, Jesus predicted that no stone would be left on another. So even the, the wailing wall that is there today, it is not part of the proper temple structure. It is only a retaining wall that was around the original temple. Why are we getting this big history lesson today? Because the things that last in the kingdom of God are not buildings and objects. And this gym, this will not be our legacy. Now, isn't that a weird thing to talk about? Aren't we about to give a whole lot of money to this gym, Pastor? Good grief. Yes. And we're about to work really hard on this. But this gymnasium will be a tool. It will not be what we worship. It will not be what we're about. And any future buildings will not be what the church is. The church is the people, amen? Let me show you a verse, and this is, this is out of the book of Psalms, and you might recognize this one. This is Psalm 23, if you've got your Bibles, because I think we're still rebooting our screens here. Psalm 23, verse 1. Do you remember this? It says, the Lord is my shepherd, David said, and I shall not want. What he means there is, I'll lack for nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Now, picture all of this that David is saying. David is saying, God meets every one of my needs. He, he lies, lays me down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Do you see the peace there, the provision there? God restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Do you see it? For his namesake. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. David says, God takes care of every need in my life and he gives me peace and he gives me joy and he meets all of my deepest needs. He also gives me a path and a purpose to walk in this life. And it's the Christian path, right? It's the path that Jesus has for me. And David is praising God for all of that stuff. It's like the gifts on Christmas morning. God gave me all of this. 
But he said, he gave it to me for a reason. And the reason is for his name's sake. What in the world does that mean? For his name's sake, for, for his reputation, for his glory. You go to church and they talk about doing things for God's glory. That's a weird thing to say, isn't it? To us outside the church, it's like, what do you mean for his glory? What do you mean for his reputation? What do you mean for his name? And this is a concept that goes all the way through the scripture. It's a really, really big deal. But why? Why does God care so much about his reputation and about his glory and about his name? Why does he care so much? Is he a needy God? You know, we're in this worship series right now. Is God up in heaven just really needy for some people to sing some songs to him? No. 1 Corinthians 13 says that love, true love, agape love, does not seek its own. It's not selfish in its nature. So God's love is not selfish in its nature. So then why, why does God seek after his name and after his glory? And why should we care about the name of Jesus and, and the glory? Here's the way that I think about it, and this illustration might help you. Imagine, if you will, Imagine that you lived in a place where there was a great disease and people were dying of this disease all the time. It was just, it was a terrible, terrible thing. And in the midst of all of this, in the midst of all of this risk and despair, and there was one doctor that came along and said, I have a cure for this. Now this doctor, this first doctor, can you imagine this first doctor? This doctor had great marketing Right? He, had, he had a great logo, great brand. Everybody knew about this doctor. The one problem is that his pill didn't cure anybody. It was a false cure. But then a second doctor came along, and the second doctor had the actual cure. His pill actually healed people, and you went to this second doctor. You got the pill, and it healed you of the disease. Guess what the purpose of your life would be from that healing point for the rest of your life? to get as many people to that second doctor as humanly possible, would it not? Yeah. To save as many as humanly possible. And if, if bad stuff was said about the second doctor, wouldn't you correct it? Wouldn't you try to get his name and his glory and his reputation out there? And even if the second doctor was considering his own actions, wouldn't it be wise for that second doctor to also build trust in himself and in his cure? Why? Because as many people as possible would be saved. Guys, we live in a world full of false cures. And people are dying. They're dying spiritually. And their marriages are dying. And their relationship with their kids are, is dying. It's all. It's all. And Jesus comes in as the cure. And so we speak about Jesus. And we lift him up. And we long for his name to be lifted up. If I be lifted up, the son of man, I will draw all men to myself. Why does he do all these things for me, David said? For his namesake, so that other people can find him. So that David, I can be the story of God to point more people to God. So bring it all back around. We will not be as a church about buildings. We will not be about stuff. We will not be about brands and about logos and lead pastors. We will not be about any of it. We'll be about Jesus alone. Amen. Amen. Come on, people of God. Amen. Amen. We will be about God alone. It is necessary to stop at moments like this of celebration and just make sure I, our priorities are clear. Amen. Let's pray one more time. Lord God, we lift you up right now. Jesus Christ, your name is the name that is above every name. And that matters to us, God. And we're mindful right now, Lord, even now, of the fact that you've brought so much healing, so much salvation into our lives already, Lord God. And we can see the other people, family members, friends, that need you. And so, God, we pray that your name would go forth and that your message and your love and your healing would go to them. In Christ's name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Um, so we're in this worship series. So, so um, it, we talked last week about the fact that we're worshipers of God. Amen? We're worshipers of God. And we've been talking about these Hebrew words for worship. And there's a smattering of them up there. Hebrew words for worship. And we talked about the fact that 
in the ancient languages, okay, in the Hebrew, um, there are maybe nine, maybe even more different Hebrew words that all say praise in your English Bible. Just like when you're looking in the New Testament, there's a lot of different words in the ancient Greek that mean love or say love in your English Bible. But it, they carry nuance in the Greek. And the problem is that our English language that just doesn't have enough information in it sometimes to truly convey what God's trying to say. And so we go back sometimes to these ancient Hebrew words to get those nuances back and to learn how to worship God, how to praise God. Because worship is not just the singing time before the sermon, amen? Come on, second service, I'm gonna need you today. Let's go. It's not just the singing time before the message. And worship music is not just a playlist next to your country music playlist, amen? It's not. Worship is when you adore the king of the universe. You exalt his name in your own life, in your family, in your church. This is what praise is meant to be. It is to worship. It's to assign the true worth of God. Because he's the only one that's worthy. And man, we worship other things, do we not? We worship other things all the time. We set other things above God. And that is, that's where everything starts to fall apart. So we're going to worship him today. We talked about two of those words last week. The very first one was halal. Say halal. Halal. I know it's a hard thing to say halal. That's the main word for praise throughout the book of Psalms. It means to be clear, to praise, to shine, to boast, to show, to rave, to celebrate. It means all of those things to lift up God and to go crazy about him. That's halal. The, the other word that we talked about was called shabak. Say shabak. Shabak. You got to like have a Hebrew degree to say that. It's like a popcorn kernel stuck in the back of your throat. Try again. Shabach. Shabach. Don't choke. Don't, don't do that. Um, so those are the two that we did last week. So we got some, we got some great ones for you today. Um, the first one is called Yada. Yada. Come on. Yada. Yada. And the second word is Nasa. 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 Um, sometimes they're used separately. Sometimes they're used together. Yada nasa. So yada is the verb form of yad. Yad is the is the noun. It, it is just hand or hands. Is yad. That's my yad right there in the Hebrew, I guess. Okay, but to, yada is to use my hands, to extend or shoot the hands or to throw stones. And nasa is to lift the hands or to carry them to take your hands. And so we'll look at a, a couple of these. Uh, before I do, I just want to show you just a, a little image. And this is an image of what's called a Hebrew lexicon. A Hebrew lexicon. So this is the kind of tool that pastors tend to use in their studies as they prepare for messages. Almost every pastor has some kind of version of this. So as we're preparing to give a message to other people, and some of you guys have these in your own private Bible study as well, especially if you're leading a Sunday school class or, or, a, or a Bible study or Sunday school, something like that, um, you can actually access what's going on in those original languages. So I've got a software version of this, and, and basically I'm sitting there, I'm reading across the text, and I can just click on like lift there, and I can see, boy, the Strong's definition is... Nasa, it means to lift, to carry, or to take. And I can be reading down through scripture, and I can click on any single one of those words, and it will tell me what the Hebrew is that was behind that in the original language. Does that make sense? So that's kind of how, a little bit of how we get to today. So let's look at the first verse. I'm going to show you Psalm 134, verse 2. Psalm 134, 2. So these are different examples of this Nasa and Yad, right? Lift up, Nasa, your hands, Yad, toward the sanctuary and praise the Lord. It's a very simple thing. Instead of just singing, which th that might be easier for some of us, it actually says extend your hands out toward the sanctuary, toward the church building, right? Toward the temple where God's worship and God's people are gathered together. Sometimes they were, they were away from the temple and they would be praying and they would be praising God on their own and they would extend their hands out toward the sanctuary. It's like, like I'm there with you guys. 
kind of a deal. And I'm praising God. It's a, it's a hand of praise. The next one, Psalm 28, 2, hands of need. Listen to my prayer for mercy as I cry out to you for help. As I lift Nassau, my hands, Yod, toward your holy sanctuary. And then desperate hands, I lift or paras my hands, Yod, to you in prayer. I thirst for you as parched land thirsts for rain. Have you ever been in a place like that with God? God, it doesn't feel like you've talked to me for months. God, it feels like everything in my life is going wrong. And I thirst for you, God. Everything is desperate right now, God. And the psalmist there says, I get to a place where I'm not putting up my hands in triumph and in praise to God. I'm extending my hands in desperation. I I imagine him bowed on the floor with his hands out. And what I want you to see there is there's a lot of different ways to utilize your hands in worship that can make sense, but they're an expression of your emotion. Have you just seen a lot of this in the church? A lot of people do a lot of different things with their hands, do they not? And it depends on what kind of church you've come from, what kind of church you've been in, but different people, a lot of times it's an expression of their personality or it's an expression of where they are. I remember... Uh, Jacob, my son, my oldest, and I can tell more stories about him since he's back to Hillsong College now, thank God. Um, <laughs> but when he was a little kid, he, he got into everything. He got into every single story, every single cartoon. Bob the Builder, anybody Bob the Builder? He was all into Bob the Builder and wore the hat and had the tools and all this kind of stuff. He was into Dora and Diego and he was into all that. He was super into um, uh, Monsters Incorporated and Mike Wazowski and Sully and, and Buzz Lightyear and all of it, right? Like everything was so much joy for me as a dad. But one particular joy was special for me because I loved Superman. Because Superman is the best superhero. I just love Superman. So when I got to show my son Superman, and do you remember the song? Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun, dun. Come on. Dun, 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 dun. Then his hands went, dun, dun, dun. Every single time, right? He's like four years old, and his hands would shoot straight up. He couldn't help himself, you know what I mean? Because not only did the song demand it, but in that moment, he was Superman, right? So good. Sometimes our hands do stuff as an expression of our emotion and how we feel in that moment. And sometimes it seems to make sense and sometimes it doesn't. Can we practice some hand motions right now? This is going to be like vacation Bible school and you're seven years old again, amen? Amen. Let's, let's try this out. I've got some legal hand raises for us to try out right now. Um, the very first one, everybody with me, is carry the TV. Anybody got, anybody, you see that? Like they're, they're, they're up there, they're worshiping, and the hands are just down here. It's a very subtle, non-charismatic way to get involved in worship, amen? And then if you're extra, you can go widescreen. Everybody go widescreen with me, right? You can go widescreen on that. Um, you can go, my fish is this big, like I'm worshiping God and my fish is this big, Amen? right? (laughs) Next one is hold my baby. Like I'm ready to receive, hold my baby right there. And then if you're extra, you can go Mufasa all the way up. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Praise the Lord. You got that. Excellent. Next is goalpost. Amen. For you sports people in the past, we got goalpost touchdown right here. Next is high five the Lord. Like I'm, I'm so into this right now. I am high fiving God. You guys are a great crowd by the way. And then washing the window. Let me see some wash the window. (laughs) <laughs> it's like the karate kid, right? Wash the window. If you're extra, you can do double. I'm just, I'm washing, I'm washing. <laughs> There's a lot of ways to do it. All of it. <laughs> Maybe not all at once. And here's a really key thing, especially in church. Go vertical with whatever you're doing. Don't go this way, amen? <laughs> you're gonna punch somebody and we do not want that in church. Look at 1 Timothy 2.8. So important. The Apostle Paul says this. He says, In every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands, lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. And he just, Paul just has this image 
of people who are so sold out in their singing, in their prayer, in their worship of God, that they're fully into it. And, and, and they're bringing these actions to God, not to show off to anybody else, not to, not to make anybody else happy, nothing like that, but, but because this is their true authentic expression to God. And I love that. Here's the next word, Barack. Not Barack Obama. <laughs> Barack. And so the meaning of this word, it's an ancient Hebrew word. It's super, super powerful. It means to kneel or to bless. And we're going to spend a good amount of time on this one before we get into worship at the end here. Barak, to kneel or to bless. What you see with Barak is it implies a king. I'm going to kneel because there's a king. Amen? So let's start to make sense in your worship. I'm going to kneel because there's a king. I'm going to bow down because there's a king. See, the worship starts to take a very, very different tone when I'm thinking about kneel or bow is I'm surrendering to God. I'm allowing him to be king. He is king ultimately, but is he king in your life? So to worship God with Barak means to make him king in your life. Look at Psalm 95 verse 6. It says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel, that's Barak, before the Lord, our maker. And then watch verse seven, super important, for he is our God and we are the people that he watches over, the flock that is under his care. See him appealing to them? He's like, bow down to him as king, surrender to him as king because he cares for you. He's a good king. See, we've had bad authorities in the past. We've had bad kings in the past. So we struggle with this. But God is a good king. David reminds us of that. 1 Corinthians 29, 20 says, Then David said to the whole assembly. Now, this is the coronation day of David. It's when they would have put the crown on his head and made him king publicly. It says, Then David said to the whole assembly, Give praise or barak to the Lord your God. And the entire assembly praised or they baracked the Lord, the God of their ancestors. And they bowed low and they knelt before the Lord and their king. This is something that makes sense in the Bible. But for many of us, especially as modern Americans, we struggle with this. We struggle with the idea of monarchy. Because we cast off our monarchy, didn't we? We cast off our British king. And we revolted against that. A lot of good reasons for that. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be an American. I love democracy absolutely love democracy. But this is something that is a struggle for me as an American who loves democracy. And I come to these spots in the Bible and it's like, I'm back to monarchy. And how in the world does this make sense? Can, can, we, can we admit that we have that struggle? And not only do we have that struggle, we have that struggle in prayer. We have that struggle in worship, but we also have that struggle kind of everywhere else in our life. Because the question that it's going to come back to is, is who's in charge of you? Who's in charge of me? And is he king or not? To, to bow is to say, you're my king. That's Barack. Um, C.S. Lewis said, democracy is medicine, but it's not food. Democracy is medicine, but it's not food. Let me explain that. We've had bad kings. We've had bad authorities. We've, there's been bad husbands. There's been bad wives. There's been bad moms and bad dads and bad teachers and bad coaches, right? And they've been broken and they've had issues and selfishness and they were harsh, cruel, whatever the thing was. And we didn't want to submit to their authority. And I get that. We didn't want to submit to their authority. Why? Because they were a sinful authority, and so Lewis comes in and says, listen, democracy is medicine, it's not food. What he's saying is the problem is that we've got sinful leaders. The problem with, problem with monarchy in the past and having kings and queens is the fact that they are sinful, evil people at the end of the day. And they'll make mistakes. 
even governments like socialism, as, as, as good as socialism might sound to some, or Marxism, communism might sound to some, eventually you get to some people at the top who are controlling the whole thing, and then it all goes south. Because those people are broken, sinful people. So democracy comes in as the medicine to what's broken. It is not food that actually sustains a human soul. And we get stuck on democracy and rights and fighting for rights and fighting for equality. It will make sense up to a point in your life and then it will eventually start to break down because it cannot satisfy you. What in the world does he mean? You ever notice how maybe you don't have an official king in your life? But what we do is we go and we find we find other kings to worship, do we not? In our culture today, we'll grab, we'll grab every celebrity, every sports star. We'll even grab people like, like um, politicians, God help us. And we'll let them influence us. We'll say, I, I, I wish this person's term wasn't over. I want them to rule. Right? We'll, we'll hold people up as kings over us. Musicians, for heaven's sake, will do this. Because there's an emptiness inside of us, and we want to fill it with something. Even look back at the old tales, right? The old legends. It's like, as soon as King David was no longer on the throne, you look at Jewish literature, everybody's looking back to the, the golden age of when King David was on the throne, because he was a good king. And then even more modern legends like King Arthur. What's the legend essentially say? Is that we had a good king on the throne and peace and safety and joy came into the kingdom and you wanted to be a part of that kingdom and now he's not on the throne anymore. Even Aragorn, if you know Lord of the Rings. What's the story of Aragorn? Is there used to be kings and now the kings aren't there and everything's bad because the kings aren't there. And maybe there's a hidden king up in the north some, somewhere who's eventually going to come back and take the throne. And he's going to be a healer because the hands of the king are the hands of a healer. And that's the way that that legend came in. And, and, and is trying to fill the void that we have in the human soul. Because we're made for a king. You're designed from the ground up for a king. You just are. So how is this going to work? Look at Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to see some of this come about in this coronation psalm. This would have been the coronation psalm. This would have been the song or the poem that was read or sung on the day that David was coronated king, crowned. And it was used, scholars tell us, it was used also for every Judean king after him this was read on the day. So look at verse 1. It doesn't sound very happy, does it? Why are the nations so angry? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed one. That's, that's Mashiach. That's Messiah. So we're talking about David, but then all of a sudden we go over into Messiah. Do you see that? So this Hebrew poem, what it's doing is it's saying, we're crowning David today and we're crowning the physical human king, but we're also looking ahead to the final king that is Messiah. And this poem is going to go back and forth and talk about both of them almost simultaneously. But look at verse three, let us break their chains, they cry, and free ourselves from the slavery of God. Isn't that weird? So the mood of people, of the kings of the world, all the other nations, is how dare God try to enslave me? How dare God try to be my king? And their mood is no. That's what the scripture says. Our mood toward God and his kingship is no. And what are we afraid of here? Again, we're modern Americans, are we not? He's going to take my rights away. He's going to tell me what to do. I'm not sure I like that very much. 
and I'll be the slave of God. I don't want to be the slave of God. Yeah, first service got really quiet at this spot too. It's okay. I'm not sure I want to be the slave of God. Let me tell you the first piece of good news. When Jesus came and he looked at the disciples, he said, I have not treated you like slaves or like servants. He says, instead, I've called you friends. He says, instead, I've called you friends. Why? He said, because a master doesn't tell the slave what he's all about and what the big picture is and the why and the purpose of everything. He's like, but when I've come to you as God, I've told you everything I'm about. I've told you exactly why I'm doing the things that I'm doing and where all of this is headed. He's like, I've invited you in. That's a different kind of relationship. God's not looking for you to be his slave today. Even though, in the verse, that's our fear. The second thing we got to, uh, got to realize is that we all have a crown on our head today. You walked in with it. It's called your choice. All of us were given free will and free choice by the Lord. It's one of the greatest gifts that you've been given in your life is you have the ability to love God or not, to, to follow him or to reject him. And that crown, that represents for this personal kingdom right here, I'm in charge. What do we do with that crown? Okay, let's keep reading. The king proclaims the Lord's decree. The Lord said to me, you're my son, and today I've become your father. Now at this point, it's really talking about the Messiah. It's God the Son and God the Father. And the book of Hebrews really goes into this and describes it very, very carefully. He says, I've become your father. In, in the actual original, it says, I've begotten you. I've begotten you. Which is that ancient language for, um, I gave birth to you. You were born today. Anybody know another verse where that's said? John 3, 16. He's God's only begotten son, right? That's Jesus, his only begotten son. So it's the same kind of language. You're my son. Today I become your father. Only ask, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the whole earth as your possession. You will break them with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. And that sounds violent to us, does it not? Woo! So God says to Jesus here, he says, listen, I've got a plan and it's for one kingdom. It's one kingdom and they're all going to come to you. He's definitely not talking to David in this moment, right? I'm gonna give you all the kingdoms of the world, every single one, and then you're going to smash those clay pots with a rod of iron. Why does he say that? Here's an I think. I think he says that because every single clay pot is a mini kingdom. You've got the big kingdoms, you got the small kingdoms, you got the tribes, you've got the races, you've got the languages, you've got all the different ways that we split ourselves up. And he's going to come and he's going to smash all of that and he's going to unify it under one kingdom. And he's going to bring his peace, love, and joy to all mankind. Does that make sense? That's the rule of God. Verse 10 now then, you kings, act wisely. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverent fear and rejoice with trembling. Submit to God's royal son. And, and, and that, word, that, that phrase there, it's really weird. It says, kiss purity. Kiss the purity. Kiss the son is what's in that original text. And what it imagines is like that signet ring that a king would wear. You would kiss the finger, you know, you'd kiss the ring on his hand as, a, as an image of homage to the king, submission to him, submit to the, God's royal son, or he will become angry and you will be destroyed in the midst of all your activities. Sometimes Christians will say things like this. See if you've heard this before. They'll say, you know, there came a moment and the song played and I went forward and I prayed the prayer and what I, would, what I did is I reached out for Jesus to be my savior. I wanted him to be the God who loved me, the God who died for me, the God that would forgive me, the God who would keep me from hell. I wanted all of that. I wanted the good stuff, amen? But later on, I realized that I'd never let God take control of my life. I'd never let him become Lord. Call the shots. 
And you've known people like this in the church where it's like I come on Sundays and I say I'm a Christian and I'm saved, but I live my own life and I live it exactly the way that I want to. See, this passage, can we have that last slide back up real quick? It says, watch it, it says, serve the Lord with reverent fear and submit to God's royal son. That's lordship. That's saying that crown has to come off your head. It's saying God has an opinion. God has an opinion about all of it. God has an opinion about your savings accounts and your 401ks. And he wants you to loosen control and to give him control. And, and, and for you to submit to him and to bow down to him, that's a real thing, amen? Come on, second service. Is that a real thing? I think so. And when our marriage is struggling and we surrender that to God and say, I don't know how to fix this, God. You're going to have to help me fix this, God. And maybe I'm going to have to change, God. Maybe I'm going to have to get some wise counsel, God. And, and maybe I might have to do some things that I really don't want to do, God but I'm going to surrender to you. Do you see the bow in that? Do you see the homage in that? Do you see how he just became king over your marriage? See, it's, it's like we, there's so much that we're taught in this culture, guys. We're taught in this culture. I define it for me. I self-identify. Do you see that language? I self-identify. He just got real serious, didn't he? I self-identify. I'm the one who decides for me. I'm the one who decides sexuality. I'm the one who decides gender. But don't just pick on those two. I'm the one who also decides my career. I'm the one who decides who I marry. I'm the one who decides what my life purpose is. I don't care what side of the political line you're on. You struggle with this. God cares? Yes, God cares. I'd rather God not care. He's king. He's king. You want the joy and the peace that he'll bring? You surrender to him. Amen? You remember when our grandmas and grandpas, they brought, us, they brought us to that bedside and they taught us how to pray. Do you remember how grandma and grandpa taught you how to pray? Do you remember how they had you kneel down by the bedside? On your knees. And you clasped your hands and you bowed your head closed your eyes. Do you realize they were having you do Barak? They were having you form a relationship, not to a savior, but to a king. That's why you bowed. We have to recapture that in our own walk. That's why it's like this, this whole series, this whole study about worship is so important because these are the steps that we take. Worship is not just singing songs. Worship is taking the actual steps in your life that you desperately need to take. And Barak is a huge one to surrender. It's not just coming on Sunday morning. It's like, give me a little bit of, uh, of Bible. Give me a little bit of a lesson today. I want my little devotional for today. There are things you need to do. And God knows that. And he's giving you opportunity in every single song to re-surrender your life for real to him. There's another verse I've got to show you. This is Revelation chapter four, verse 10. I think you're going to like this. Revelation's so fun to talk about. So it's this image of the end of time, right? And you're up in the throne room of heaven. And God is on one mega throne with Jesus right there in the center. Can you see it? Turn your imagination on. Let's go. Can you see it? And then around him, there's 24 thrones. 24 thrones, and it says 24 elders are sitting on those thrones. Who are 24 elders? Here's what I think. They're the 12 tribes of Israel. On 12 and it's the 12 apostles from the New Testament who follow Jesus. And what they represent to us is all of God's people in the Old Testament, all of God's people in the New Testament, and they're all together there surrounding God's throne. And it describes them and it says they all had their own thrones and they all had their own crowns. And then you get to see, because you read ahead, I saw you, 
Verse 10, what they do, 24 elders, they fall down. They worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you, God, are worthy. You know what they're saying there? They're saying, I'm not. I'm laying my crown down because I'm not. You are worthy, O Lord God, to receive glory and honor and power. So if you've never done this before, here's what I'm asking you to do today. I want you to lay it all down. I want you to make him king because he's not been king for you. And maybe he used to be king for you. And maybe you gave him control at one point, but then little by little, just like me, you've had moments where you took kingship back. No. God, you weren't handling my marriage very well. I'm going to take that back. You weren't handling my career very well. I'm going to take that one back. And we do that. Resurrender. Amen. Resurrender. Would you guys stand right now? We told you before at the beginning, don't be checking your watches for lunch. It's not lunchtime yet. We got worship to do. And we're going to walk through this together. And I don't expect all of us to like drop to our knees right away like some of you couldn't physically get back up if you did. <laughs> so ask yourself that question first. But how are you going to do this? I would recommend as we go through this time, find your way. Tried all the different hand raises, right? Some of you guys might bow. Some of you guys just might bring your whole heart for the very first time to worship today and you might really connect with God through these songs. We're gonna have three songs. You're gonna have some good opportunity here to really walk through this. Don't get nervous, right? Don't get caught in nerves. Don't start wondering what other people are gonna think, right? It's just you and God today. You're approaching his throne in the throne room of heaven. I just want you to see yourself there spiritually and maybe take a risk and see what happens to you. First service, I, I picked a little spot in the second song and it made sense to me and I bowed down on my knees. I had some of the best prayer I've had in weeks. My knees were bowed. I saw the king. It's a beautiful thing. Some of you guys might even, if you're making a lordship commitment for the first time, you might even come up to the stage and bow at the stage. There's a moment in the book of Job where Job had been talking a lot and he gets to a spot where God comes and speaks to him and Job says, I place my hands over my mouth. Why would you do that? Why would you place your hands over your mouth? Because you've been talking too much. And that may be your submission to the king today. Is that I'm just going to do this. Or I'm going to do this. Find your way, amen? So we're going to practice this. Let's pray. Lord God. Lord, I'm not just praying, God, for what we do, Lord, during the songs. What I pray that you would do, God, amongst us, and even for our folks that are online right now, Lord, what I pray that you would do, Lord, is that you would take us to a new place of connecting with the King right now. And whatever it is that we have to do, Lord, I pray that we really would surrender, Lord. And I pray that behind these songs would be prayers, heartfelt, desperate prayers, Lord, that come out of us, God, where we do real business with the King of the universe. Come and change us today, Lord. We love you. In Christ's name.